is you're going to see a bony contour that the root is stressing the bone. It's not exiting the bone, but it is definitely stressing the bone. So as I looked at that, I thought, okay, I don't see anything wrong. Well, the young man calls me up this week. He says, I've got a real problem. I've been out of town. In fact, I've been out of the country. I'm now in country and my tooth is starting to hurt and it's hurting constantly. So we don't hesitate. We take another cone beam. We go in and we take another look at number 14. And again, what I'm going to do is align with the roots and we'll start with the mesiobuccal. So the mesiobuccal root appears to have some loss of bone right there. If I get to the distobuccal root, it appears that the root is completely sticking out of the bone. Now, I'm not sure how that can happen because he hasn't been undergoing orthodontics. But here's the apical view and that tooth is sticking out of the bone, the roots are. So either we're moving the tooth out of the bone or the bone is going away from the tooth. And so we determined through pulp testing that the tooth was non-vital and he needed a root canal. Now, if he needs a root canal, I'm gonna to go to my axial view and I'm going to now try to find out if there is one, two, three canals, continue to scroll and I see a fourth canal appear. So I've got an MB1 and an MB2. I go back and align with just the mesial root. And I try to align in all three planes. What I'm looking for is the MB2 canal separate. Yes, there it is. And does it stay separate the entire length? Now you'll notice I'm having a hard time seeing the end because the root is curved. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my cursor up farther and then I'm going to tilt with the curvature to try to find the apex. And now I can clearly see the MB2 canal exiting here and the MB1 canal over here. So we use the comb beam to compare last year to this year. We saw the problem. We then used it to help plan the treatment. The final thing I will do is I will just generally speaking, go in and measure and say, okay, my apex locator had better come up with a number around 21 to 22 millimeters. And if it does, I know my apex locator is working because that's the number that I am right now if I were to open up into this tooth and do an endodontic procedure. Now, we were able to do the endo and take care of the patient. So this is how I use a computer, or I'm sorry, how I use the comb beam in everyday practice. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to walk you through some other patients. And as I do this, the reasons behind the, each patient will vary. But I thought, well, let's start with uh, what we do for a child. So I've got a 13 year old and I simply go alphabetically up to his name. I do it this way. I could print his name in, but I'm really slow with the printer. So Bennett. There we go. 13 years old. And what we're looking for is eruption patterns of teeth. 
you'll notice by looking in the upper arch that his number seven is lingually positioned to the rest of the arch and number 10 is rotated. So we have a crowded scenario and I will continue. I'll grab the lower left picture. If I'm on a line, I'm making, I can move that line up or down, but if I've got a cross, I can move both lines up, down, in any direction. I make that cross in the lower left picture, but I'm looking in the upper right, I'm sorry, upper left picture. And by moving it up in the upper left picture as I'm watching, I'm going to observe the shape of the teeth, the canals, and the position of the teeth, number seven being very lingually positioned. If I decide that's where I want to go, I'll come up to the upper left picture, make the cross, go to number seven. I align it by putting the axis on it in each box, upper left, lower left, lower right. Now I can see tooth number seven and I can axially scroll looking at it from the tip of the root here to the crown. I can look at it from the front of the tooth, facial and lingual, or I can look at the side of the tooth, mesial to distal. And I'm using the roller ball on my mouse to gently walk my way through. You know, I have a lot of doctors who say, well, how can I read these? And I look at them and say, you're already reading them. You're, you're reading a 2D film. So if I take this picture right here, this is what a 2D film looks like, except instead of being the entire tooth, it's only a slice in the middle of the tooth, but I'm still looking at it in two dimensions. All I'm doing with the roller ball is changing that slice to a different place on the tooth, but it's still now a 2D film. So all I'm doing here is reading a series of 2D films, one segment at a time. Kind of like watching the old uh, film movies, one frame at a time, even though it's on a spool. So I go through and I walk up axially the upper arch. Axially, the lower arch. And as I do, I'm scanning, my eyes are constantly scanning that upper left picture for any problems, issues, cavities, abscesses, tooth position problems, anatomical issues. And I can do this in a matter of a few seconds because I've looked at thousands of these. When you're first doing it, you might want to take the cursor and we'll go look at the left side. So I'm going to line up the blue line with the arch of the, the bony arch, the green line with the tilt of the teeth, and the purple line here, again, with the tilt. So a slightly lingual, slightly mesial tilt. And now I can walk through the sagittal view and see all of the teeth as they appear. You'll notice the teeth appear at different times in different ways. We've got Tooth number 17 here, 16 there that are just forming. Then as I come forward, come buckle, I can see the roots of the developing number 18, the completed roots of 19. I even see a little cavity getting started here in 19. And I can walk all the way through. Now, I do the same thing for the upper arch by simply repositioning up and facially, and now I can see 16, 15, 14, 13, and I can walk my way through. Interesting, look at number 12. How many of you want to do a root canal on that tooth? So this is the way I do a new patient exam. 13-year-old, 20-year-old, 90-year-old. It makes no difference the age. When I utilize my comb beam, I can look at any tooth. I can look at the nasal spaces. Look at his turbinates. 
larger on the right side, smaller on the left, the space. So possibly we have an allergic patient here. Crowded dentition, small arch form, goes with airway. So we look at the airway, his looks pretty good. Probably allergy symptoms. Um, you can start doing an awful lot of things evaluating your patient when you're seeing the entire structure and you're not looking at just one or two teeth. All right, got a couple of raised hands. So what questions do we have? So the first question uh, in reference to the first, um, and I have raised hands, let's see if we can bring them up here. Uh, so I have you as uh, Dr. McFarland. I'm gonna allow you to talk and ask your question. Sure. So Dr. McFarland, I'm gonna, there you go. Okay, got me? Yep. Uh, what view are you using right now in that upper right screen? Okay, on the upper right screen, hmm? that's called a 3D rendering. And I rarely use that except to grossly demonstrate something to patients. That's not diagnostic. It's the upper left, lower left, and lower right screens that are diagnostic. Yeah, I understand that. You know, it's a lot of times when I have patients and I want to show them something. The one on my screens in the office, I'm going to go over this with John. I'm going to have, after we're done, I'm going to have him look at him. But okay. a lot of times they look, they don't look like that. It looks like there's bone missing in a lot of areas. On the upper right? Yes. Right, and that's because, again, not being diagnostic, this is nothing more than a, a drawing, uh, like you'd go to a, down to do a lineup, and they'll say, what does the, the, the uh, assailant look like? And you draw it in. It's a, it's a bit of artistry to just say, look, this is a, a representation of things. It's not to be viewed as being accurate. The less dense your bone is, the more it's gonna look porous. I can change that bone density by holding down on the right and left sides of the mouse. I can make it more dense or less dense or even go away. Okay. So, yeah, just, just for demonstration purposes. That was it. Just, just demonstration purposes. Mrs. Smith, your child has crowded teeth. Look how these are crowded out, and you can see them. So, I might do it something like that. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. McFarland. Uh, and we have, I have you listed here as Joyta. I'm going to bring you up, allow you to uh, talk, and we'll unmute you for your question. Question was, what's the field of view? The field of view on this is an 8 by 10. Okay. And so for all new patients, you do 8 by 10 field of view? 8 by 10 is my most common field of view. If okay. I get a terribly large male, typically, it could be a large female, but I'm typically, I think of a man six foot four, uh, very wide bony structure, I might go to a larger field of view because I sometimes cannot get their airway. But you'll notice on this picture, the airway is very clear. I can even see part of the spine. Yes, okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, doctor. And uh, we have from Dr. Weimer, I will bring you up. Okay. Patrick, go ahead, unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, Dr. Julian. Uh, so how do you handle the, the billing on a new patient with, uh, with the, you know, are you charging a Panorex charge? Are you charging a, a Combi charge? How do you deal with that when you're taking uh, scans on everybody and, and with insurance too? Okay, well, first of all, understand that insurance, for the most part, does not accept cone beams. Uh, they accept panorexes. So if I take this patient, for example, and I go back to the patient list, you'll see a one image, and I'll click on that image, and there's my panorex. I've now legitimized myself to charge the insurance company a panorex. So I'm gonna get out of that because I really don't like the Panorex view. So when I do this, <clears throat> I'm going to charge to the insurance company a Panorex fee. I feel that a Panorex fee is even fair to charge the patient. So I charge the patient 105, 110, whatever a normal fee for a Panorex is. If you charge that kind of a fee, that insurance accepts and patients are comfortable with, you will take a lot more panorexes. I'm sorry, a lot more cone beams. If I 
find a patient has just had a, a Panorex taken and they've been charged to their insurance within the last six months or so. I'll take my cone beam image for free. Now, the reason I do this is because I find more things on a cone beam than I have ever seen possible to find on Panorexes or PAs. I also find that patients can see the very things that I'm finding. So I'm doing more dentistry by making this available to people at a low cost or even no cost in some cases kind of scenario. And I make it no more objective and have no more barriers to it than taking a Panorex for a patient. So, so you just kind of build it into your fee. Build yeah. it in, exactly. Good questions. Thank you very much, doctor. And next we have, uh, well, we, we have a comment in the chat from Dr. Siegel. It says MetLife pays for CBCT. He doesn't charge for it otherwise and will bill for a pan. He is one of our Prexion users in PA. Okay, so, so if an insurance company pays for it, then that's great, that, that's good. And I feel like eventually insurance companies will pay for it. The more doctors are using it, the more it becomes a standard but uh, sometimes they're slow to follow suit. Okay, and one more hand raise in the chat. Uh, Mark Kaufman, I want to bring you up. Yes, hi. Um, I'm enjoying your, your seminar very much. I want to ask you, um, what type of, um, does every software uh, integrate with others? And um, how do you forward this, this technology or these uh, images to other dentists? To review and how much uh, backup of storage use is used on your computer that in order to, comp uh, to compensate for all these images? Okay, you ask a lot of questions there. <laughs> um, let's talk about the storage first. I'm not a computer guy, but with my limited knowledge, I know that some cone beam companies ask you to upgrade your computers to get the the cone beam installed because you're using their soft or their storage capacity. This company, when I bought the first one, they said we have our own server. What that means is they have the capacity to store all of the images and you have, can use those images on your computers without utilizing any storage. So when I bought this, I didn't have to upgrade any computers. Mm -hmm. Now, how many images can they hold? I don't know. I've got some four or 5,000 images on my server and they're still doing well. And so John can address the technical, if it's a terabyte or how many terabytes or whatever they store. But this machine through Prexion doesn't have any stress on your existing computer system. As far as sharing the software, everything I'm doing, I can, uh, I can put to a disk any image of a patient I take, and it is limited on, every, on some of the software applications, but I can send that disk to anybody with a PC and they can pull it up and manipulate it on their PC. So it's very friendly to people who are not very computer adept like me. Can you email it? Um, John, can you email these? You will have to use a you know, third-party service like Google Drive or um, Dropbox. Dropbox. Yeah. Um, one, one of those, but, uh, you know, typical email, you know, Gmail, Hotmail, you know, whatever it is you're using, the file's just too big. And but, to answer, answer your question, doctor, about storage size, so the, the Prexion um, ships with a two terabyte hard drive. There you go. And, and as far as the emailing images, I can take any single image, like I'm, I told you, we're, we're simply doing a slice and stopping and looking at a 2D picture of that slice. And I can email pictures of slices to anybody very easily. I've done that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I can also get on a go to meeting or Zoom meeting and manipulate computers back and forth. I think there's another software called AnyDesk and I can get on with another doctor and I can manipulate his computer software in his office. So it's very flexible. Okay. Um, okay, thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Thank you, doctor. Um, and then one last question in the chat right now, Dr. Julian, uh, it's from Paige Van Curen. She asks, does purchasing a CBCT have an effect on your malpractice premium? Okay, I, I hate to admit this, but my office manager could probably answer that question better than I could. I'll sign the check, but she's the one that pays attention. 
and yet I don't believe it's had any effect on my malpractice. Uh, I don't remember any issue ever being brought up about having a CBCT. Uh, one of the things, and, and John, I have to be careful because I, having given a seminar, I want to make sure I don't repeat myself. On the other hand, I want to make sure I don't leave anything out. One of the questions that a lot of doctors ask is, will I be more liable because I have a CBCT? And the answer is no. In fact, you are more liable because you're missing things right now with 2D. Panorexes and PAs, they miss 30, 40% of the dentistry that exists out there. The problems and pathologies are missed because we're using 2D. And doctors are being sued for this all the time. So having 3D makes you less vulnerable to a lawsuit, not more vulnerable. And therefore, I don't see the malpractice ever being affected in a negative way from, from that aspect. And Dr. Okay. Siegel had contributed to that as well. He says, I did not see an increase in anything but income. So thank you, Dr. <laughs> Siegel. <laughs> Very good, Dr. Siegel. All right. So let's, let's do this. Let's stop here and go to another patient, okay? And we happen to be in the same part of the alphabet. And what I like to do is I like to pull up patients. This patient was seen again this month uh, when we were in emergency mode. And he calls me up and he says, Doc, I've got a toothache. And I said, okay, let's take a look and see what we're looking at. And he said, on the lower right, that would be number 30. So I drop down, go to number 30. I take the green line and line it up which in the lower left picture now gives me the sagittal view. I line up with the tooth, and then I go over here and make sure I'm approximate on the angulation, the tipping of the tooth. Now, I'll go to my lower left picture and double click, which enlarges the picture, and it allows me to see a curious lesion that is very close to the nerve. Now I'm looking at the pathology down here. Is there any, any abscess formation, any radiolucin areas? The answer is no. I'm very close, but I'm not pathology involved here. And I'll do a pulp test on the tooth. I'll do a percussion test. And from that, we determined that what we were going to do is a crown. And the patient said, thanks doc, I appreciate it. I'm out of here. And I said, well, just a minute. You see, now that I've taken a cone beam, not only am I not going to miss something, I'm obligated to talk to the patient about what I do see. And I said, you know, I'm really glad that we got that taken care of. Whoops, didn't mean to get out of it. But let's take a look at number 14. And so I go over to number 14. Now the blue line lines up which gives me the sagittal view instead of the lower left picture in the lower right picture. I enlarge it and I use the scroller and I slowly walk through and I see an abscess on number 14. I also see a thickening of the Schneiderian membrane, probably some liquid, some fluid build up with an inflammatory process up in the sinus. Now, when you show a patient that picture, they may not quite get it, so you might have to show it to them in two or three ways. So now I'm gonna walk myself up the root of the tooth, and I'm going to explain that there are things we see that are normal, your sinus, your sinus, and things that don't belong, like this darkness around the root of that tooth. The bone comes here and stops, and it comes here and stops. So we've developed a drainage site for the infection to escape through. I might even have to explain from this view. And again, all I'm doing is showing the bone comes down and stops, and this shouldn't be here. And the patient understands this clearly. Well, what causes the infection, doctor? And I look at him and I say, well, you've had a big filling on the tooth, it's been there a long time, and at some point the tooth died, and now you 
can talk about a root canal, you can talk about an extraction, a bridge, an implant, whatever the treatment is that you think is appropriate. And he said, well, let's talk about that because he wasn't informed by his other dentist. Now, <clears throat> at this point, I said, let me talk about one more thing. And for those of you, who, the gentleman that asked about the, the rendering, look at this. You can see right here, there's a problem. There's something different in that area. And so I took my finger and I put it on that tooth and it wiggled a little bit. I said, have you noticed that tooth is a little loose? And he goes, yeah, but it doesn't hurt. And I said, okay, let's go down to that tooth. So I dropped down until I see the tooth, it's number 24. Go to my upper left picture and I move the cursor to 24. Now I'm on the left side, so I will line the blue line up with the arch. Then I go down and line the blue line up here with the tooth. And then I go over here and line the blue line or the green line up with the tooth. Now I'm fully engaged in the tooth. And I can correct this a little and bring it over. Now, I pull this picture up <clears throat> and I show him why the tooth moves. There's no bone holding that tooth in place. And he says, why not? And I said, because you have an abscess here as well. And he goes, what's an abscess? And I said, well, that's a, uh, an infection caused by what's inside the tooth and it's spreading and causing bone to go away around it. And he said, well, what can we do? Now, at this point, I've taken a patient who has a one tooth issue, a broken tooth that's going to be a crown, and we are now talking about removing two other teeth and placing two implants and, and doing quite a bit more work. This is the value of a cone beam. It's not in taking the image and charging for it. It's taking the image and converting that image into dentistry that's needed and visualized and understood by the patient. And I'm routinely taking patients from a single tooth issue up to three, four teeth, and they're, they're very engaged because the last thing they want is infection. So this patient comes in, we walk through all the steps we would normally do in an emergency, and he said, doctor, you don't seem very busy today, which we're, because we're seeing so few patients uh, at a time. And I said, that's right. He goes, well, could you do that today? So we extracted two teeth, did platelet-rich fibrin, did a crown and a buildup, and all of this comes under the emergency care concept. So this is now a patient waiting to get an, a couple of implants down the road. And I've got a very uh, loyal patient because one, I came in to see him, and two, he saw technology he's never seen before, and he was able to participate in the treatment. Any questions on this? We do have a question, Doc, uh, not specific to that case, but um, in the chat we have, uh, could, could you talk about radiation safety for patients when taking several CBCT in one procedure? Oh, sure. And, and understand, I rarely take several CBCTs. Uh, if I take a second CBCT, a post-op, for example, it will be because I'm trying to teach something, uh, I need the film for a, a seminar I'm doing, uh, more than it will be for the patient. But let's talk radiation for a second. If I take a single PA, digital PA, I'm taking and exposing my patient to eight microceivers. Most doctors don't understand that. So I ask the question, how many microceivers do you expose them to by taking a full mouth series? And they'll look at me and they'll say with a straight face, well, we take 18. And I'll look at them and smile and say, no, you don't. Nobody ever gets all 18 perfectly, so you probably take 20 or more. And so they kind of laugh and we, we agree. So 20 PAs in a full mouth series is 160 microceverts. One cone beam, standard adult size, eight by 10 field of view on an adult is 76 microsieverts in my hands with my machine. So I'm taking less than half the microsieverts on a patient than a doctor that's been taking full mouth series for his entire career. And there are many of them out there and they're very comfortable doing it. 
but it's because they don't really understand the numbers and the comparison. If you have Panorex and uh, four bite wings, then you're taking in the neighborhood of 60 to 70 microsieverts at that. So how much information do I gain with my Panorex versus my Combi? Nothing. My bite wings versus my comb beam, almost nothing. So it really behooves me to take the comb beam at, 70 micro, at uh, 76 microsieverts. Now, if I saw a patient like that very first case I showed you, we took two cone beams in a one year span. Normally I'll take a cone beam every three to five years as a screening device. But if I take two in one, on one patient a year apart, I haven't exposed that patient to any more, in fact, still less radiation than if that patient went to a doctor that was taking a full mouth series of radiographs. So the radiation issue is really no longer an issue with our newer technology and newer machines. Now, if you have an older machine, then you probably would be wise to check with the manufacturer to see what the amount of radiation is because it has continued to come down over the years. Uh, I know where my machine is today, and I have no concerns about the amount of radiation or taking a comb beam or a second comb beam on a patient if I need to. Does that help? I'm sure she will, uh, Jamie will pop in the chat if, if she needs further clarification. Okay. Uh, we do have one uh, follow up in that vein from uh, Linda Peter. So you see no value in a FMX? I see very little value. I haven't, first of all, personally, I have not taken an FMX now in 13 years, which I think probably answers the question. Everything I see on a 2D film, and, and we'll talk about a single PA, because then you just multiply that. But in a single PA, I'm seeing the buccal plate and the lingual plate and eight to 10 millimeters of bone structure plus six to eight millimeters of tooth structure jammed into a single image. I can't walk through it. I can't do a cross section of it. It's distorted vertically, horizontally, very easily. I don't see a lot of value in that, no. Okay, and we do have a couple, uh, have one doctor with his hand up here. I apologize, it only has your Samsung listed, but I am gonna bring you up to allow you to talk. So if you had your hand up, a Samsung, go ahead and ask your question to doctor. I'm not getting Yeah, no. Okay. All right, a couple more questions came up in the chat. Uh, we have, does the Prexion software have an implant planning component? I'm sure you will go over that at some point. We can do uh, that next if we'd like to. That would be fantastic. Um, and then we have from Dr. McMahon, what is your protocol for evaluating the entire comb beam, tooth by tooth and all views? All right, so let's just do both of those with this next patient. Okay. And, and understand, experience plays a role here. When I first got my first cone beam, I would spend 10 to 15 minutes looking over images on my lunch hour. At the end of the day, I'd go in early. 10 to 15 minutes is a long time. Now I can really go through any patient in 30 seconds. Here's what I do. I grab the lower left. I look at the upper left. I'm gonna do the upper arch first. And as I go through, I can tell there's an endodontic procedure on number three. In fact, silver points were used. I can tell that just by the, the scatter. We're missing second molars. We're missing first molars. I'm sorry, third molars. And there's not a lot of restorations and there's really not a lot going on. If I go lower arch, I see a couple of implants, four implants to be exact. And I don't see very much going on there. So my eyes have grown accustomed to this to the point that I can pick things up. Now, I did pick one more thing up. And I'm going to go to it real quick and show you because if I go to the left quad and I line this up, 
I'm looking at an elderly patient, somebody in her 70s, who has an impacted third molar, number 17, that's been sitting there for years and years and years, completely impacted. And yet, there's some kind of deterioration going on with that tooth right now. Now, how did I pick that up? Because my eyes are used to scanning these images. It wasn't when I did 10 or 15 or 50 of them, it was when I did 100, 200, 300, 1,000 of them. And the, the more I scan, the better I am at picking these things up as I simply walk through each image. So I don't go to every tooth and circle around the tooth. I find that by going vertically up through the tooth, I can see the pulp chamber, I can see caries, I can look and see if there's something on that tooth I want to explore further. Because it's the unusual things we want to look at, not the comfortable things. So I know this patient has got a potential problem developing doesn't hurt now, isn't an emergency now, and I will inform the patient that, hey, you've got something going on, let me explain it. It may never be an issue for you. At your age, it may take 20 years for this to develop, in which case it's not gonna be an issue. But on the other hand, if it develops next year, at least we'll know what we're dealing with and I can refer or treat. Now, in this lady's case, let's go back and look at tooth number Four, because she came in with a broken tooth. So I go to number four, bring my green line up, line up with the tooth, and this tooth is broken. So she's broken it off at the gum line, and she would like to know, can I get an implant? And I said, well, Let's take a look. If I'm gonna do an implant, I, I'm an implant doctor, so I know I need to measure. So I'm gonna measure on the lower right picture, the facial lingual with the bone at its narrowest point. So I've got 8.6 there. I'll go down here and do another one, somewhere between eight and nine millimeters. So if it's eight to nine millimeters, Next thing I want to know is its length. So approximately I'll draw a line across the two areas of bone I can see. I'll go up in the middle and approximately 11. I have one more measurement to do. And that measurement, actually two more, is in the mesial distal view. So what I want to do here is I want to measure two aspects crown to crown, 6.3, and average bicuspids around seven. So it's a little on the small side, but it works. And then I wanna go down here and measure again, root to root. And I know if I've got seven millimeters of bone across and eight millimeters in depth, that I can put an implant in and try to get two millimeters around the implant. Well, two from seven is five and two from five is three. About a three and a half millimeter implant goes in here, maybe a four. Now that I've got an idea of size, I will simply go to my implant button, planning. I've got to move this box and where it says new. Now, what comes up is, this is kind of cool actually, because what I can do is I can eliminate this, update the list, and you're gonna see all kinds of implants. Many, many different implants. NEOS, Novell, BioHorizon, Implant Direct, Ankylos, Camlog, so, I've got a huge library, and that library gets kind of, uh, shall we say, clumsy at times. So I'm currently using Megagen, and I'll get on, update the list now. 
All I have is the different sizes of the Megagen implants. So for fun, let's just go to a four by 10. Okay, but it's upside down. So I go over here to the little V, push that, now it's right side up, and I put it to place. I can even go over here where it says outline mode, so I can see the tooth and the implant at the same time. I would like this to be a little bit oh, more mesial centered. I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna take the implant and move it lingually, maybe tip it just a little bit out, keep it away from the buccal plate. I'm right to the sinus. In fact, I might even scoot it just a touch. And I'll come back to the axial view and I'll say, there's my implant. Now, am I far enough from the root of that tooth and that tooth? Because that really is what matters on an implant, is am I avoiding all pertinent structures? And axially, I can walk through this entire case. And look at that, I didn't run into anything. I got lucky on this one. Now that I have virtually placed an implant, can I go to the mouth? and place the implant in the mouth. Do I want to construct a surgical guide? Now I can begin to answer certain relevant clinical questions. But the library is available to you to put in any implant system you wish. And you can have all, many, many implants, or you can have the one system you're working with. So I think it's very flexible that way. And to that point, doctor, we had a question in the chat about surgical guide workflow. What that looks I like. use the uh, Implant Concierge, which is a company that makes surgical guides. And all I have to do is download and send my DICOM files to that company. I don't even need to send uh, impressions anymore. I can do a scan, digital scan, send that, send the DICOM files. And John, you can show them how to do that better than I can. But the, it's very simple to do just by managing the files um, let's go back for a second to patient list. And while you look that up, doctor, we have a, um, this is in reference to the question about seeing no value in a full series of x-rays. Oh, okay. Um, and it was just Dr. Siegel and his comment was, uh, he placed an implant in the number 30 area a few months ago, took a PA, it looked perfect. For some reason, he decided to take a CBCT and lo and behold, he was out of the lingual plate and had to remove it. So, Dr. Siegel, thank you for your honesty there. I was going to say, it takes a lot to admit though, something like that, but you know he, what? He, and he says it, he says, I hate to admit it, but uh, he's a good guy. There, there are a lot of cases where we, because we're comfortable with something, like panorexes and, and PAs, we think we can see more than we really can. And I, I'm an experienced implant uh, doctor, I've been doing implants for over 25 years. I will tell you, I placed thousands of implants without a comb beam. But tomorrow, you couldn't get me to place one unless I had a comb beam image first, because I've just seen so many surprises and issues and things that came up. So I don't want to play a guessing game anymore. It's, it's going to have to be something very predictable. Uh, down here, what I did is I right clicked. And it says, add to list, open view, open view, or series management. And now I can go here to download series. So you can go through a series of steps that sends your DICOM files to a third party that can manufacture uh, a surgical guide. Okay. And that was, Dr. Siegel had a follow-up, that was uh, Implant Concierge, and he asked the cost of a um, surgical guide. Oh, don't ask me costs on anything. <laughs> I sign checks. Um, I would say it's probably in the 150 to 175. Uh, they're very reasonable. They're very reasonable, maybe $250 tops. But surgical guides have gone through gyrations and a lot like computers, the cost is being forced down by so many competitors. So it's, it's not as bad as it used to be. Let's see. 
Yeah, two other questions. We actually, I'm going to have, uh, have Bob from Good Doctors here. I'm going to bring you up to ask your question. Go ahead. So go ahead, Bob. You can unmute yourself. They had their hand raised. It's that technology. It's hard to work. It is. Well, in the meantime, we have. Uh, how about pre-authorizing for perio quad scaling? CBC will work? No. Now understand, I can diagnose a lot of perio bone loss, but unless I have periodontal measurements, soft tissue measurements of pocket depths, that I can't diagnose perio. So I can get a very good indication clinically that I have a periodontal problem, but until I have the measurements, the soft tissue measurements, then I cannot get a diagnosis of perio. So you can't do it with a hard tissue machine only. Okay, and uh, Jamie Fernandez with another question. Is the DICOM file the only format the files could be read and let's say emailed? Is DICOM the standard? Yes. John, am I right on that? <laughs> you are correct, doctor. <laughs> All right. I told you I'm not a very good computer person. <laughs> And then Dr. McFarlane uh, in the chat, he just wanted at some point if you could review um, measuring uh, once again. And then also he asks, can you take a picture at a specific point? Um, if you like, I can pull him up to ask if you need a little more clarity on what he means. No, no, I think I've got it. Okay. Okay. Let's go to another patient here, Kelly. Now, Kelly, let's do what we just, we've already done. First of all, stop and look on the lower left picture. And look up here, and what you're looking at is the nose. That's the inferior turbinate. Now you don't treat the inferior turbinates, but you're going to become a little bit conversant in understanding whether a patient has an open airway or not, or whether they've had nasal surgery or not, because that will destroy the turbinates. Then we're gonna look at the sinus. Now, not all of you are implant doctors, but if you're an implant doctor, the sinus is a concern at times, and some of us graft and some of us don't, but the sinus should be dark and clear, and this patient is dark and clear. Open sinuses, no problems, no issues. Now I'm gonna take, make that cross, I'm gonna start looking on the upper left picture. The first thing I see is a good arch form. And now I'm gonna walk my way, I see a filling on number three. I'm gonna keep walking up. As I go up, I find out that there is an absence of first of 16 and number one and number 16. And I keep walking up and I find good bone structure, good arch form, there's a nasopalatine foramen. There's the sinuses appearing. The one on the right is bilobed. There's a little separation. The one on the left, single, big lobe. And now I am done. Okay, let's go to the bottom arch. So we grab it, now we work the other way. Now, let me go to the bottom arch and stop at a point right here. I can see the enamel outlining every single tooth. And I know there is no class two caries anywhere here until I get to here, where a filling has been done. So where there are existing fillings, I may still need a bite wing radiograph because this doesn't allow me to read everything as perfectly as I would like. Over here where there are no fillings, this is better than a bite wing radiograph. So there are still reasons for 2D at times. Now I go down. I'm watching, I'm looking, I'm not seeing any evidence of anything that's getting my attention. And when I'm done and I've examined, and maybe I'm new to cone beam and I will now go over to the left side, do a little bit of manipulation here and look at it somewhat enlarged. There are those fillings I looked at earlier. And boy, these teeth look pretty nice. Sinuses look good. Let's go to the other side. You see, I'm just lining things up for a starting point 
And now I'm scrolling and looking at roots, crowns, all the structures. I can stop at any point and say, well, it's just like a 2D. That's just a picture in space, only instead of all the bone and all the tooth, it's a piece of the tooth sliced in the middle. When I get done with this patient, do you know what I found? I have a healthy patient. I know without a doubt that I'm letting that patient go, telling them accurately that they have no cavities, no abscesses, no dental problems, and they're healthy. And that's the difference between where we are today with 2D. Patient walks out, I could have missed, 30% of my patients will walk out with something that I missed. So this tells me that a patient is healthy and it's not a waste to take it on a healthy patient. It's reaffirming that yes, they're healthy. All right, let's do one more. Because you're gonna run into things that are unusual. And this is what scares us. Should we send everything off to a maxillofacial radiologist? Why don't you pull that up, Dr. Julian? Um, Dr. Siegel had a follow-up. Uh, why don't you sure. print your own guides, surgical guides? Oh, um, I'm just not ready to do printing yet. Um, I've done some research on it. I looked at it. There's a lot of printers there. But the accuracy of a printed guide versus a mailed guide is not there yet. And it, it's one of those things that I, I can't do everything and one of those things I haven't done yet, but I think it's probably coming someday. Any more questions? And we'll do this case. Okay, same thing. Grab the cross, lower left, Move it and look on the upper left. Now I'm going to do the upper arch first because I always do. I see a large nasopalatine foramen. I see clear sinuses, everything looks good. Let's go to the lower arch. And as I go through the lower arch, I see two root canals, 30 and 31. I see a rotated bicuspid, number 20. I keep going and everything looks good and till there. Now, what I see is something right there. And one of the things about pathology is it's never bilateral. So what I wanna do is I would like to look at the lower right side, I'm sorry, lower left side, and look at the shape of the jaw. Now I'm gonna to go to the lower right side and look at the shape of the jaw, and it's different, quite a bit different. So what is going on here? Anytime I don't know, I'm gonna take the cursor and I'm gonna move it to the problem. So I'm, I'm lined up right in the middle of it there. And I'm gonna look at it from all three views. So we'll go upper left, and I see an expansion of the jaw in a manner that does not look normal. It is well-defined, the patient has no symptoms, he's completely unaware of it. And then I'm gonna go, again, cross-sectional view, and I'm gonna watch it appear, and then it's gonna get smaller and disappear. It does not appear to have any influence on the intraavular nerve or these teeth. However, I found it's interesting that this patient has had two root canals in the posterior right side. And the question comes up to me, I wonder if somebody saw this on a PA and determined they needed a root canal. Sometimes dentistry gets done by accident. So here we are, what do we do with this? If you don't know, send it to somebody who has more experience. And if they don't know, send it to a maxillofacial radiologist. What'll happen is you'll see this once. You'll get a definition from a maxillofacial radiologist. Then you'll see it a second time. And now you don't need to send it because you already understand what it is. 
and a dysplasia such as this is benign. It's not harmful as long as it doesn't grow to an excessive size. So the answer from the maxillofacial radiologist on this was to simply monitor over time. Now, how do you monitor this? Do you monitor it on a PA? No. On a Panorex? No. You monitor it on a comb beam. Every three to five years, we take a new comb beam. If we see it enlarging, we'll take one a little more frequently. But anytime you run across something unusual, that's when you involve maxillofacial radiologists only for those things that you don't understand. And as you see these things, and you do send off and get an answer, you learn. And then the next time it's not so surprising to you, it's not so new. So we will gain so much just by reading scans over and over again. John, I see some questions. Yes, so we have in the chat, um, could you demonstrate how to localize the inferior alivia? Olivia, your nerve and outline it. Yes, all right, good question. Um, let's just go back to that same case, might as well. So, first of all, I'm gonna go down. I'm gonna pick a side. Let's just go ahead and pick that side that's got the problem. And I'm gonna line up with the arch. Now, when I do, I see in the lower left picture the inferior canal. Now, watch what happens as I take the blue line in the upper left picture, I can make that canal widen or go away because the green line is either getting into the middle of the canal or it's exiting the canal. So let's get a nice wide picture, okay? At this point, I'm going to go over here where it says implant planning, mesial, mandibular canal, and new. Now I'm gonna hold down on my control button, which will cause that little star sun with radi, uh, radi, radii sticking out of it. And I'm going to click the left side of my mouse. And as I click, I'm gonna create what I think I see as the inferior canal. Now, right here, it gets a little bit fuzzy. So, I'm going to go down, whoops, to that area, and I'm gonna say, wow, we've got a metal foramen there. So, I will go over here and again, click on my control button, and I will bring that out. See how it appears right there? When I'm done drawing it in, I'll hit the edit button. And now the canal is drawn in, and it will stay. Now remember that button I pushed a while ago, outline mode, I'm gonna click on it to click it off, and now you have a solid, picture of your inferior alveolar canal. Now, why do you see it here? Because the plane that you're looking through is walking toward the facial, and that's exiting toward the facial. As I walk lingually, it goes in lingually until it begins to connect to the rest of the canal there. And if I look at that, from this viewpoint, I can follow that canal in relation to any root of any tooth all the way back. Now I can tell you from experience that that tooth or that canal varies buccal to lingual, varies in height, varies in size, and relationship to teeth. In this case, I'm very curious how it relates to that expansive mass of bone there and it's completely separate from it, completely walled off the entire time. Did that help? John? I believe so. If not, uh, please type in the chat. And, and, and what you have to do is you just have to practice this, practice this, practice this. Once you've done it a few times, this is very easy. I do this all the time. 
Okay, we have a question in the chat, doctor. Do you use different CBCT settings or picture editing for implant versus endotherapy? No, the same setting. Um, you, I, I'm a simplistic person. I really don't want to spend a lot of time manipulating buttons. And so this software helps get me through any procedure on any patient at any time, whether it's endo, restorative, implant, surgical, it makes no difference. Okay, great. Well, there are no other questions, Doc. So unless there was a, another case you'd like to show, I think uh, we're about at the end of our hour, a little bit over. So last chance, if anyone has a final question, pop it in the chat and the Q&A. Let me just say that the things you're gonna see, a mucus seal, I've had doctors call and say, what, what is that thing in the sinus? Mucus seals are very common. The nasopalatine foramen, extremely varied in its uh, appearance. And it, it, there's a lot of things about the nasopalatine foramen that we don't even understand. And it, is an enlargement a nasopalatine duct cyst or not? And making that determination. Um, the inferior nerve we just touched on. Any pathology or any benign or aggressive pathology, trying to differentiate. And then unusual anatomy. In fact, let's do this real quickly. Let's take the same patient because you just found the inferior alveolar canal. I found something unusual with this patient. If I look on this rendering, I see two mental foramen. It's on the left side. So I go and I look where the mental foramen is and there's a second branch. They both lead to the inferior canal, but having it branch is not something I was ever taught in school. Another thing I saw in this patient, I think it was this patient. Well, tori just a little bit. Now, sometimes you'll pick up on accessory innervation points, little tiny canals, and you'll see lines in the bone, and that's simply where the, the uh, neurovascular tissue is entering in to feed the bone. So if you're an implant doctor, Sometimes you find these things that are in a place where you want to place your implant, or if you have an option to move away from it, that's a good thing. So I, I look at this with every patient. I look at the teeth, the bone structure. I look at the airway. Um, all of these things, your eyes will start to get accustomed to catching all of that information as you look through these cone beams. I think it's a fascinating learning tool. I'm a much better, I recognize pathology, I recognize anatomy, I see the uniqueness of anatomy, um, everyone's different. And what I thought was normal, not necessarily the case today, what I used to think was something abnormal, maybe it's a normal structure today, and now I've got the information that can help tell me if I'm on a dangerous track, a right track, uh, if I need to ask questions to somebody, all of these things are, are reasonable. It's the learning process is what we're after. And nothing's going to teach you like a piece of technology like this. John, any more questions? Any more comments? Uh, one quick question. Um, I can answer this one. One in the chat, does the software come with the machine or is it a separate purchase? It is included. And any future updates to the software, all of that is included. Uh, which is great. And then one last question in the chat from Wes Moore. How do I reduce scatter on patients with multiple PFMS? Well, <clears throat> 13 years ago, scatter was a huge issue. And what the machines have done today is to get better with every generation. The amount of scatter on that crown 
is much less than what it used to be. So I don't know how you get rid of all scatter. It's not possible yet. But when you're below the restorations and the bone and the roots, I rarely, if ever, see any problem in that area. Uh, you saw today a silver point in an endo, and that creates a very minor issue. So it's, again, it's not a perfect technology. It's just so much better. And when I run into too much scatter, I may have to resort to a 2D film uh, just to get another set of eyes, another view of it. And so bite wings, I can't get rid of them yet. Uh, PAs, even though I don't like them, there are times when I find them useful. Okay. Well, doctor, thank you very much. Uh, this was awesome. It was great walking through. And, and to our attendees, thank you all so much for the interactivity. And um, Jim, please emphasize that when they're on a chat like this or a webinar, if they ask questions, that really helps the presenter. So I, pre I appreciate all the questions that were asked today. Yeah, no, we, we uh, really enjoyed having it and, you know, allowing you guys to come up and, you know, see what's, what's going on. So the last thing I want to uh, show you guys, so we do have a couple additional webinars coming up at Diamond, um, first of which is next week with Dr. Julian covering CO2 laser applications in general dentistry and implantology. And then on Friday, May 15th with Dr. Favagehi combining piezo surgery and CO2 laser technology for advanced clinical applications. Both of those you can visit our website, diamonddentalsupply.com slash education and register there. Also while you're there, I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. Uh, it highlights clinical cases, keeps you informed on what we're doing, where we'll be, um, and gives you the opportunity for a free CE every month. And finally, if you have any questions or just want some information regarding the Prexion specific to that, or if you're a current Prexion user and would like you know, additional how-tos, um, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to help you out. And uh, you know, thank you all for your attendance and hope to see you real soon. Thank you, John.